And now it's time for another edition of What Would Jello Do? The Great Betrayal, Part 4. That trick never works. We could have declared victory after killing Bin Laden and gone home. So says Tony Blinken now, but where was he then? At Biden's side, and Obama didn't listen to him. By then, of course, thanks to Bush and Cheney and Rumsfeld and the rest, the mission had changed. Mission creep, they call it. We went from trying to hunt down and get Bin Laden and why get rid of the Al-Qaeda to trying to conquer Afghanistan. We could have negotiated a settlement with the Taliban 10 years ago when Obama was still in, when we realized we were never going to conquer Afghanistan, and we still had a position of strength. They weren't as strong as they are now. But no, 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 we never talked to terrorists. We wouldn't even sit down and talk to them. W and Company did have Al-Qaeda and the Taliban on the ropes when we went in, but then right when we had them stopped, maybe even beat and stamped out, we turned and ran to try and conquer Iraq. What's more, the British Guardian at the time reported that in fact, Pakistan's ISI intelligence, along with us, knew where bin Laden was all along. And the decision was made by the ISI and Bush to not go in and take him out because that might cause the, Af the Pakistani people, many of whom support the Taliban to this day, to revolt and take down our pet dictator, Pervez Musharraf. That sure worked out well. He got deposed a few years later anyway. I am the great and powerful Coelacanth. We will hunt you down and we will make you pay. He said that right after that bomb of the innocent people at the Kabul airport. I was thinking, how hollow is this? You can't hunt down suicide bombers. Just look all over the ground and there's pieces of them blowing in all kinds of different directions. Oh, we're going to hunt down Al-Qaeda and this so-called ISIS Special K and make them pay. Where do they come from? Isn't it amazing how all our zillion dollar drones and satellites and intel, whatever that means, we were bribing to try and turn them in, never seems to find them in Afghanistan or the Pakistani side, which neither one of them can really police. All these years, it was a tale of two armies, one poorly equipped but highly motivated and ideological true believers, the other well equipped with our tax money but dependent on NATO bombing raids, poorly led, riddled with corruption, fancy equipment, but widespread illiteracy among the people who are supposed to know how to run it all. But meanwhile, they we're getting these reports back from our generals with optimistic predictions. Oh yeah, we're slowly winning. Oh, the mission is progressive. What was the mission? And this was coming from Petraeus, from McChrystal, from Michael Flynn, if I'm not mistaken, as well as James Mattis. Oh yes, things are progressing. We're turning the tide. Wasn't that what kept us in Vietnam until Daniel Ellsberg exposed what a lie all that was and the Pentagon knew it was a lie? That trick never works. Just like Vietnam, here was a military so top-heavy it couldn't even fight a guerrilla war. Top-heavy due to the military-industrial complex forcing all this fancy gear on the Afghan army that we were supposedly helping. Their mission is never world peace. Their mission is to make more money and make more of these throwaway weapons and everything. We thought we could force a central government on the Afghans and buy off warlords to do our dirty work at the same time. Instead, they gave our guns, they turned their guns, that we gave them against each other. We were occupiers. Therefore, we were colonizers. We went from trying to get bin Laden to wipe out the, out, and wipe Al-Qaeda to trying to conquer all of Afghanistan and privatize it too. 
30,000 private military contractors. I don't know if one of them was named Blackwater, but I have my suspicions, and you know how they behaved. Often these guys were getting paid way more than our own military, six figures a year, and they were supposed to train and mentor the Afghans who held these high positions, but a lot of times they never really did the work at all. They just took the money. And we had all these bases, 200 plus, to, but we were only able to supply by air. That's not how you fight guerrilla wars. Supplied once a week, maybe, but then all of a sudden we were pulling out and we stranded all these people depending on these airdrops. Suddenly there weren't any more food, there wasn't more weapons, there wasn't even any more water. And the Afghans were so dependent on this, they couldn't operate without it, but the Taliban could, just like Vietnam. Bloodthirsty recklessness on our part didn't help either. Not just the warlords we were giving these weapons to, but there's been case after case after case of Americans just going into villages and killing a bunch of people, just like Vietnam. Chelsea Manning, the there was a patriot who leaked all those documents through WikiLeaks showing how we were doing this. And when we said, oh no, we didn't know that was a wedding where we blew up and killed all those people with a bomb, we thought they were terrorists and she proved they weren't terrorists. But then I also have to ask, how many other weddings have we blown up? How many other men, women, and children became what Alexander Haig so cynically named collateral damage? That's why they never really wanted to fight for us deep down. We were killing their own families. That trick never works. You know, we can't impose that kind of democracy, we call it, on others if they don't want it. You can't build democracy by allying yourself with people who don't believe in democracy, especially when you kill so many innocent people, it's clear you don't believe in it either. Remember Vietnam, destroying the village in order to save it? Well, the local fighter always knows, ultimately, even in Vietnam, even in Afghanistan, the graveyard of empires, they will outlast the foreign occupier. Why? It's their home. We're just occupiers, colonizers. Americans have the clocks, but we have the time. Mullah Omar. You can kill 10 of my men for every one I kill of yours, but even at those odds, you will lose and I will win. Ho Chi Minh. Persistence. Playing the long game. They do it because they have to, and they do it because they know how to fight a guerrilla war, and they're smart. It is counterproductive to build democracy in other countries according to foreign templates. Vladimir Putin. So now our allies, NATO people and whatnot, who are so hoping Biden and company would really make America competent again, that's now dashed. Just like Trump, it's really all about Americans first. I am the great coelacanth, and we are committed to getting every American out. What about everybody else? Do you care about the women that you're leaving behind? Biden's asked at the press conference. No, I do not. He snaps. Yeah. So once again, there's all this talk, even among NATO nations, maybe we need, it's not just Trump who wanted to abolish NATO, maybe we should because we can't rely on the U.S. anymore, and we shouldn't at the end of the day to keep getting dragged into these misadventures when maybe long term, if there's another Trump that gets in, we may have to unite against the United States. America only really ever cares about themselves. It's always been American first. America first. The blob syndrome again. Yeah. Come on, blob. Quit lying so much. Nobody believes you anymore anyway. We can't just run around killing people in other countries who are no threat to us. No more Blinkies Fun Club, Tony. Ari Melber gave out a fit statistic saying that this war was costing us $300 million a day. David Plouffe, the old Obama guy, quoted the figure $50 million a day. Either way, 
that is a hell of a lot of money we've squandered in Afghanistan and we're not even getting to Iraq yet. Every time Biden proposes all this money to properly rebuild our infrastructure, properly get people educated, housed decently, finally get a high-speed train system in this country, things like that, get rid of all these student loans. Oh, well, even Joe Manchin, the goes, no, we can't do this. It's too expensive. You can't even think about spending this much money. It's too expensive. That's where the money went. That's where the money is if we quit fighting these dumb wars just to satisfy the blob. No more Britannia rules the waves to our global war and terror. It doesn't work. We finally just need to admit, in this case, along with others, we lost. We totally lost. It's our fault and we have to move on and be smarter from here. And the only way we can prevent even more defeats like this over and over and over again and blowing all the money we could be spending like the Europeans do to winterize buildings to fight climate collapse, not wait for the market, just do it for crying out loud. The only way this ain't gonna happen again and again and again like Vietnam, Korea, and so many more We've got to get out of this, well, the war could have been won. One of the blob, that old ambassador, Ryan Crocker, what a reptile. He's been on saying, no, we get 10,000s of troops back in there and Afghanistan will be fine. Wrong. We decide we can't be, or other people decide for us, we can't be the indispensable nation anymore could actually be very liberating. It sure was for Great Britain when they gave up on trying to occupy and conquer India any longer, or Afghanistan, or Nigeria, or so many other places. It was a huge monkey off their backs that they could then put towards their own people instead, to the degree that they actually did. Wouldn't having to earn our credibility back actually be a good thing? Here's where to start. This war is not over and may never be over until we really do get everyone out. What I'm really worried about is this one went so badly that Biden is going to use it as an excuse to chicken out and not get us out of Iraq. And we made Iraq vastly worse than what happened in Afghanistan. They had a much higher standard of living. We wrecked that. Women had more rights to the degree that Islamic country women have any rights. Under Saddam Hussein, they were way better off than they were under Saudi Arabia or the Emirates, let alone the Taliban. And we still have one Trump card left, if you'll pardon my French. And that is this. Afghanistan is in deep shit. The Taliban know it. Inside Afghanistan, nothing works now. They're try still trying to get the banks open, let alone one airport in Kabul. Half a million people displaced, half of those just since May. Drought going on for years, of course. Rampant COVID-19 going on, of course. Wheat production down 40% because of the drought, leaving 2 million children in Afghanistan at risk of being malnourished right now, including half the children under five. Afghanistan has lost a lot of their most skilled and educated people overnight. We did get them out. How many more air traffic controllers do they have? Qatar has been flying some in to try and get Kabul or airport open right now. But then there's all the other airports in Kandahar and Kunduz and the other places. You got to get those on too. When are you going to get all the electrical power back on? Who do you think you are? New Orleans? New York? They haven't even talked about the traditional loya jirga from all around the fire with all these tribal chiefs and warlords, big and small. They're not going to know how to solve all the brass tacks of this either. What happens to people's savings? What happens to the Afghan currency? 
How much is it going to be worth? Inflation is going nuts right now. What happens to the banks themselves? There's $9 billion. The, most of the Afghan Federal Reserve in the central bank they parked it outside the country in our banks because they thought it would be safer that way, and we won't give it back to them now. So citizens can't get their money out of the banks. They're getting shot at for trying. Exports, imports have cratered. The borders are all closed, and a lot of the roads are too. And accessible funds still left in the Afghan Central Bank for the Taliban to try and fix this between 0.1 and 0.2% is left. Afghan economy, I've seen reports, Washington Post says 43% depended on foreign aid. Another report said 80%, but let's go with 43. And 30% of that is from the World Bank alone, who just cut them off. The IMF just cut them off too, as did Germany, where they got $300 million that could go a long way, parked there too. What this adds up to is a position of strength. If we get over this jive or feeding the American people that the Afghan war is over and at least wage peace instead of war with all that money we're sitting on, we'll bring you food, we'll bring you medicine, we'll let the money back in as long as you open up all those airfields we stupidly abandoned so we can fly in and get all the people who want out, out. Get a lot of that military stuff we left behind, too, out. But why not use the UN soldiers to do it? It doesn't have to be us. The United Nations Assistance Mission in Afghanistan, UNAMA, already has offices all across Afghanistan. And yeah, they may just blow that off and hope they can get it all back with money from the Saudis and the Emirates, Qatari and Bahraini, and even money maybe from Pakistan and Russia and China. Why? Why what do they want with Afghanistan? Well, Afghanistan is still sitting on as much, supposedly, as a trillion dollars worth of copper, iron, cobalt, gold, talcum, and of course the drugs are still pretty good too, and a hell of a lot of lithium, which is a rare earth mineral, is it not? And what do all our phones and these electric cars we want everybody to switch over to, they run for now on lithium batteries. Russia would sure like some of that. They'd like to have a lot of that, like they have natural gas that they then pipe into every place from the Ukraine to Germany and can arm twist those people to obey them or they shut the gas off. Same with the lithium. China would like it too. They've already been negotiating for months with the Taliban to bring Afghanistan into their so-called belt and road initiative. They're already put $60 billion into Pakistan to try and put an economic corridor connecting the Xinjiang province where they're holding the Uyghurs all prisoner to a Pakistani port called Gwadar on the Arabian Sea, somehow avoiding all the other pipeline fiascos and stuff they think. Roads, railways, pipeline, President of Pakistan, who is an ex-cricket star, Imran Khan, totally bought off, where he said, oh, as far as I know, no Muslims are being abused in Jin Xinjiang, just abandoning the Uyghurs altogether, some of whom had escaped to Afghanistan and were training with the warlords or the Taliban to go back in and fight on behalf of their people. What happens to that? The Belt and Road Initiative, it's in Africa, it's in South America, all the places we don't want to give foreign aid to anymore to build roads, railroads, all these other things. They're happy to come in and the dictators are happy to have them. We're China, we don't care about human rights. We'll just build you your railroads, build you your highways, and in return, we get to build the mines where we get all those minerals out and... Oh, yeah, forgot about that part. We're just going to take them all back to China. Yeah, which means one of these things in, Ka in Pakistan has already been attacked, too. And we still, even so, 
have a way stronger network of alliances than China, let alone Russia and the vast so-called cultural clout that they still don't have. I am the great and powerful Coelacarth. For the last seven decades, the choices we have made, particularly the United States and our allies in Europe, have steered our world down a clear path. The blob path. Isn't it time for a new path and by necessity, new people? It can't just still be the same old blob of our neocons versus their neocons. There should be no more neocons. And don't just defund the CIA. Don't just defund the Pentagon. Don't just defund the police. Above all, can't we at least now defund the blob and the mentality of the blob for good?